I have an unusual role. Uh, it's a technology interface role. I spend a lot of time talking to uh, universities and governments to help to, um, uh, to guide them. And one of the things that I perpetually come up against is misunderstanding of common terms. Uh, and it doesn't matter whether we're talking about system or yeah, design and research development. There is lots of terms which are out there that people are using and they don't really understand them. But I think uh, one of the problems that I have here is particularly with development and product and research uh, then it's, it's kind of important that we understand this because uh, if we don't get the society aligned with the real understanding and if we're not aligned with the real understanding then we're likely to be focusing on the wrong thing, so it matters. Now, because I've got grey hair, I'm inevitably going to talk a little bit about the past because I think it's, it's important to recognise that things are not the same and whereas research and development and product undoubtedly are terms which are very old the ideas of what was inside them have changed quite a bit. Like this, this is an interesting telephone because it was the telephone I bought 40 years ago and it had a 20 year lifetime. It was in the market being sold for 20 years. It had not a single transistor in it. These are metal rectifiers. These are, this is a uh, ballon, it's a, 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 uh, a transformer. And these two are actually uh, light bulbs running in the red region. They're AGC controls. There's nothing in these things which are, which are electronic. And then, of course, if you look at something like this, you know, billions of transistors on, on tens of integrated circuits inside that, and probably only has a lifetime of around one year. The logical conclusion to this is all has simply become irrelevant. But I will challenge that conclusion because I don't think it's strictly true. I mean, even in the last 20 years, Moore's law has significantly changed ARM. When ARM started, a typical integrated circuit was around a million transistors. Um, today, you can get 20 billion transistors for 5 euros, change the uh, unit to whatever suits you. Uh, but essentially, you don't design a 20 billion or a 2 billion transistor chip using the same approaches that you used for a million transistors back then. And again, so even in the last 20 years, does this mean that history has nothing to teach us? No value to add in terms of the, uh, these activities. Now I'm going to go back even further though to demonstrate that there is a relevance here which goes even beyond me. And it's our forefathers. And it's, it's looking at this which I think really starts to, uh, to develop a better understanding of, of the research and product and development in roles. Because it was Cro-Magnon Man, which is us, emerged out of Homo sapien 100,000 years ago. This is an interesting thing, sorry, 30,000 years ago. Homo sapien was 100,000 years before that. For something like 32,000 years, we didn't do anything other than survive. That was our principal objective, just to live long enough to, to, to breed and to pass our genes on. And incidentally, those genes are the ones that I'm wearing today. The philosophers, I am conceptually wearing them today. The philosophers didn't appear until around uh, 35, 33,000 years later after its existence. And these guys started thinking about nature itself. They had obviously enough food, enough warmth, and enough comfort around themselves that they could actually start thinking about something else. It took a long time for us to get there. And it wasn't until around 1,000 years later that the scientists started to ask ourselves what happened when you took the properties of, of nature and started doing things a little bit with them, interacting, mixing, uh, banging things together and seeing what happens. Understanding nature, manipulating nature. Just 260 years ago, the Industrial Revolution. They created a very interesting one because they created exploitation of nature. This was the point at which science, which had been gathered during that particular time, actually was put together into products like steam engines, uh, like water transport, canals, boats and so on. That was the major time that the exploitation of the, of the science and so on, which had, which had been acquired over the previous couple of thousand of years, was actually put to public use. Got this out to people, got the people to pay for it, and all of a sudden we have year zero of science meets exploitation, which is really pretty well uh, the onset of technology-based businesses. So 
we've got a, an answer here in many respects that research is establishing stuff which is background knowledge and development is converting that into something which has got public value and it was done by our forefathers so over 260 years ago this thing hit the headlines and that's what we're doing today is really developing that now I also want to look a little bit at technology because technology itself is also a factor in this now these are computers you may not recognize them as but this is um, Hyperacus's Antikythera anti uh, what's the word 87 BC long time ago two and a half thousand years ago and it was a mechanism for computing planetary positions now it's not a computer in the sense that we recognize it as a stored program computer but it is actually an embedded computer in the sense that you put it into a box the knobs you turn some knobs and something comes out which amounts to a prediction it's very much like an embedded system which involves microelectronics inside it um, the technology was quite different of course it was limited by the available metals which pretty well had to be handmade and the gears were cut primarily before there was things like files reliably available this is done by scraping materials against one another very very basic another interesting one is Babbage's difference engine again a computer um, this is digital base 10 it was too expensive for the technology of the day so it wasn't that it wasn't possible to make it was just that it was too expensive for them to make so it was an interesting aspect here of making or designing a, a computer which was uneconomical to make mechanical technology nevertheless still a computer and then you've got things like this which is uh, Amsler's planimeter planimeters are fascinating machines if you've ever seen them they allow you to calculate the area of arbitrary shapes drawn on paper and so on they're still used today there's a modern one um, as a concept this is 1856 and as it was a mechanical thing for, cal for cal calculating the area of arbitrary 2d shapes it was resolving that equation um, the technology was precision mechanics now so you are talking about really good quality engineering here uh, but in a mechanical technology and then of course you've got something like uh, <coughs> University of Manchester's baby computer which is the the first or claims to be one of the first anyway stored program computers a lot more familiarity on this area now it's digital based too but it is it is electronics but the electronics are valves not transistors and the sophistication of the product of course is much much less than we would recognize as a computer today but it is the basis of the computers that we know today now what I hope you've seen on this one so far is that actually the available technology limits the product options so we've got engineers who are still basically capable of doing the same thing as they are today in fact as they have been do it, capable of doing it for the last 35,000 years so it's not just something which um, which modern people are able to do because they are modern people these are things the people who designed those systems in the past had the same brains as you and I just that they didn't have the technologies available they didn't have the tools available so they're just as ingenious and they were trying to produce a product which met a customer need and they used the technologies that they could get their hands on as a way of doing it the technology and tools available when you start your product development limit the technology you can use in your product that shouldn't be a surprise to anybody but actually we have a habit of going ahead and developing products with technology that we haven't got yet you know, on, the, on the promise that it's going to turn up fairly soon we go ahead but it is a decidedly risky activity because the consequences of anticipating are that you blow your time scales and you blow your budgets and you miss your market opportunities <coughs> now customers don't actually buy technology is another another message that should come out of those slides as well they buy solutions to their needs so there was calculating tables there was working out the planetary positions there was um, in the case of the stored program computer that was a little bit more general purpose they wanted a programmable um, computing machine the planimeter, the planimeter of course was something that an engineer or an architect would be using when he was calculating something which was important to him so it's the need that people buy or the, res the resolution of the need that they buy 
and the product must be affordable in that context, which is, of course, why uh, uh, Babbage's uh, computation engine didn't work, um, because it was just too expensive to make. The other thing that's apparent is that not all solutions are equal. You can take available technology and you can produce a good solution or you can produce a bad solution or you can produce a million in between. The customer will ultimately decide which is the one that he wants to buy uh, on the basis of criteria which he has applied, not the criteria which you have, you have applied. But it is also interesting to note here that that spark the difference between a good implementation and a bad implementation is the role of an engineer. And the good news about that is I, will see, I see it as a perpetual role of the engineer because an engineer will always bring innovation to something which is otherwise a, a, a regular implementation. So it will remain an important feature of engineering is solving problems which you haven't got an instant solution for, or the way that you use the tools and the, cap the capabilities and the methods that you've got to provide a solution which is otherwise uh, superior. Now, new technology then only provides product options. Now, this is a great downer if you're a technologist and you like the idea of technology. The main thing about technology is it isn't a product in its own right. It only enables products. And not all new technology is valuable. So is it valuable to go to 14 or 10 nanometer node? Um, the answer is it depends on the product you're making. It's not an obvious link between 10 nanometers and a better product. And not all of the technology will make a valuable difference to your end product. And it's the end product which we have to be careful of here. Because the end product is not just what we make, it's what people use our products in. And those are the people who buy the end product who ultimately flow the money back down the line. These are you and me in our other lives. We all have two lives. We have our engineering life and we have our, the life in which we interact with ordinary people out there in the streets. And we do stuff which, uh, which ordinary people do. Now, I want to bring this in because around this point we, we start to get uh, confusion. I mean, this is something which comes from NASA and the US De uh, Department of Defense, therefore has a lot of credibility. It's the technology readiness levels. And you'll see this out there, and it sort of illustrates a line which starts off with basic principles and goes to um, a proven something. Now, I'm, I'm being a little bit vague about the words at this point because one of the big problems this has is it's frequently misinterpreted because that top word there is production, then people, who are non-technical, tend to assume that production is synonymous with product, and that product, therefore, is a developed form of a single science. So you take science, you develop work on it, and you produce a product. Now, it's a very simple model, but it's a wrong model. We know that products are more complex than this. We know that technology products depend on lots of technologies, not just one technology. And in many respects, you can take any one of them out and that ceases to be a useful product. Without the LCD technology, without the touch technology, that's a useless phone. Without the RF technology, that's not a phone at all. You know, so these are um, concepts that we're familiar with, but a universe out there which just thinks that what we do is we take an innovation, a scientific innovation, which occurs predominantly in universities, and we just work on it, and we get a product, and the product becomes an international product in its own right. That's the mission that society is driving us down, the line that we're driving us down. Now, end customers don't make this any easier, because if you talk to a lot of people, they talk about technology, and they mean the stuff that you buy in PC world. You know, I've got technology, I've got one of these, you know, and it's, it's not really a reference to technology that they're making. What they're talking about is a technology product. But they consider that that is technology, and because it's technology, then these are also the people who are our politicians, and the politicians are the ones who determine uh, university research programs, and they also determine priorities in universities for teaching and so on, and essentially... They are, that misbelief does cause us a problem because it means that we get taught that way and research actually goes that way. 
Politicians make this, it's a big mistake to make, with the consequence that we're taught and thus how we work. So it is important to, uh, to, to clarify exactly what we are talking about then, because if this isn't how products come about, then we need to think about how they actually do come about. So 2014, another product, Canon EOS 5D, a beautiful camera, but of course quite different to cameras only 10 years, 15 years, 20 years ago, which had film. Um, the uh, film companies are essentially out of business at the moment. Kodak, who, who had this market essentially to themselves, had to stop making film. There was no interest in film cameras anymore. Uh, it's a computer, but actually it's an awful lot of other stuff as well. And we mustn't forget that, because you couldn't make that camera without a lens. And if the lens is part of your product, then that is something which has to be considered when that product is being designed. The other thing is robotic assembly, both of the tiny motors which are in there, but also the product at a, at a larger level. To make something as complicated as this requires technology which is outside it. So it, the robot assembly is an important part of this product, which actually isn't in the product. It's in the environment on which the product is created. So we're not just talking about technologies now inside the object, we're also talking about technologies around the object. These are technologies working seamlessly together, together to deliver system functionality. A camera. It's a camera. It's a black box, actually pretty close to being a black box, so you don't know which parts of that are electronic, which parts of it are software, which parts of it are ICs. You can guess, but you don't know. You do know there's a lens at the front, but that's just the input port, and there's a little plug in, in the section here where you take the memory card out, and that's the output port. I mean, it's, it's a black box in all way, shape, or form. But having the technology is not enough. I raise that question, if you can't read it from the back, it says, why couldn't ARM make a camera to compete with Canon? And the answer is, because Canon has too many capabilities that we don't have. And I think that this is a, a broader view of technologies. Technologies are really techy, they're very excited, very uh, exciting to us. But capabilities are the bigger thing. Canon can make cameras for all sorts because it has capabilities in all kinds of things. Not least of which is, it knows how to make lenses, but it also knows how to, how to assemble them into a product like this to make it work. It also knows about how it's going to sell a product like this. It matters. They have connections with the high street that we don't have. That's not really a, a technical differentiator, but it makes a lot of difference because this is an end product. It's the sort of end product that you would spend two or three thousand pounds on. They're an expensive object. <clears throat> sure, our technology is in it. That doesn't mean to say we could make one, though. So we're talking about a subtle difference here, but an important one, because we're talking about capabilities. So it's actually capabilities that limit a business's options. And quickly reading through it, businesses need to know they can make a product before they start. Uh, capability, basically, capabilities, and I'm being careful here to emphasize the plural, capabilities help the managers at that time to make an observation about their possibility of making such a product. So we can make a, an assessment of our ability to, to make a camera because we will fairly rapidly draw the conclusion that we need capabilities to be, to be a camera manufacturer and these are too many for us to, to acquire. We can be, uh, generate a next, let's say, 128-bit processor core and we could do that much more comfortably because we have a range of capabilities which are more associated with that, not least of which would be capabilities, of course, to help you to architect such a thing. Um, a product, though, is still work. So even when you've got capabilities, you still have to do work to convert that into a product. But at least it's, it's known work. You know how you're going to do it. It's just physically a case of doing it. So unknowns lead to protracted timescales, blown budgets, lost opportunities, and panic. I guess we've never ever been involved in anything which doesn't have panic in it at some stage. All real development has panic in it because something here got stretched or got pushed. And it's usually an issue of not understanding well enough what it is that we're trying to create or the capabilities that we need it to have before we set off down that road. And so businesses need an appropriate set of capabilities before it commences a product. And the different products, and different products, even similar products, 
may need different sets of capabilities. So just because you've done a 32-bit processor doesn't mean to say that you have all of the capabilities that you need to do a 64-bit processor, even though notionally they sound fairly close to one another. <clears throat> so I've got to try and formalize some of these things a little bit. So I'm defining science, technology, capability, and product. And you know you can read those as well as I am. But it's, it's fair enough to say that science is in technology. Technology is in capabilities, or capabilities are in products. And I think that's the diagram which describes really what we're talking about. Product development is over here on the right hand side. You have a range of capabilities which, like an AND gate, you've got to have them all there before you can actually proceed down that route to the product, whatever the product is, and I'm not talking about hardware or software here, I'm talking about all of them, hardware, software, mechanics, systems, anything you want. A concept to a product has to go through a range of capabilities, and if you don't have them, you've got serious problems. Now you could substitute technology, or you could substitute science in, a, in those boxes if you wanted to do so, but if you did that, you would be increasing the amount of unknowns in that solution. So a little unknown uh, is by use of technology a greater unknown by the use of science. Now the major problem is moving a science to a technology in itself can, make, can take a lot of work and indeed can turn out to be impossible. Technology is something that, that is available but not necessarily available to you but it can still involve you in quite a lot of work to incorporate it into your, into your design flows even when it's something that other people know about. So we've got uh, science has demonstrated fundamentals. Technology has scaled up science, so essentially moving it be beyond the demonstrator in the university or the research lab. Um, and capability then is something which is, is installed technology. It's uh, ready to roll inside your, your company as opposed to inside another company, which it might have, you know, uh, technologies are something that another company might have, but it, it's no use to you unless it's installed in your company. And then, of course, product is delivered encapsulated functionality, that orthogonal line. So we're not talking about the vertical line, we're talking about a horizontal one before we hit uh, product. It also now quite clearly identifies that research is the business of inquiring, understanding and establishing capabilities and uh, development is the business of exploiting them. So it's using the, using the uh, uh, things that you know how to do to produce a product that you want and can predict that you can do. Now technology readiness levels then, to give you some sort of scale on those, it went from one to nine. Um, and actually nine is where the product is, but nine is actually all the way down to here. So we're really talking about making sure you can make your product is not just about having technology at the nine ready for production, ready for reuse. It's, at the, uh, it's only at that point that it enters the true development cycle of producing a product. Uh, okay, I mentioned that already. So the capability model. Um, I propose, and I think it's, it's fair to say here, that this is... Um, this is my model, it's not anybody else's model. Use this if you want to, it's up to you. Uh, but I think it's the right way to proceed, um, and I think it's up to you to decide whether you think it's the right way to proceed or not. So a definition then of capabilities being the links between research and development, an installed unit of technology, a unit of net technology, so this is not a capability to do something really big, it's, it's a, a, a defined thing, something on those lists. We need a Fortran capability. We need to be able to handle logic reliability by 10 nanometers, 10x power efficiency improvements. These are capabilities that we need, not ones that we've got today. But we know that if we're going to stay in business, these are things that we need to establish. There are answers that we need. Um, how will I handle the end of Moore's law? How can we increase our productivity in their product offerings? So we need to be helping them to produce systems because those are the people who are ultimately closer to the, uh, to the end customers. And will transistor reliability become a serious issue by 14 nanometers sufficient to break down the, uh, the strong link between um, Boolean maths and, uh, and physical implementation in gates, which we've grown so used to for the last 30 years we don't even question anymore. So capabilities are the foundations for product development and they establish 
they're established by research by literally finding out. So this is not a research department as a department in arm or a development department as a development department in arm. It is the roles. So you can have a research activity inside a development department or you can have a development activity inside a research department. It just says that the, the act of finding and creating the capabilities that you need is an act of research, not of development. <coughs> So research establishes capabilities for development engineers to use and they do it from various sources. In the short term, the known set is a good place to start. So it's refine what we know and acquire what others know. And we already do this. So we recruit people, uh, we, have, uh, we have contracts with people, we license technology, we acquire company. We wouldn't go beyond this, I don't suppose. Um, but the refine, this is a, effectively bring into our company capabilities that other companies have already got. So they have it as capabilities. We would like to have it as capabilities, so we bring it in. Refine what we already know, including individual knowledge, team knowledge, and tools. Remember that role of engineer to do that innovative thing? Well, it's important that we encourage that, not just teach them to use another tool. Teach them to use another tool, they will simply be competing with other people who are using the tools, producing a product which is a boring product. We want to have an exciting product, which means the engineers have got to do the thing that they're good at, which is engineering. The characteristics of this are sort of specific, internal, secrecy, low numbers, high cost, confidence. These are, if you like, the, the sort of signatures of that kind of activity. But long, longer term, we've got the unknown set. And of course, the unknown set is very exciting. Um, it's targeted research, it's partnered research, and it's university and institution research. It's going to cover a wider area, uh, and, it's got, and it's not going to be so specific in terms of its focus on specific product areas. Um, funded research projects might be in that, and national support programs come into here, and those of you will know at least some of these, Technology Strategy Board, Horizon 2020, the research councils which fund more than 90% of the research which goes on in uh, UK universities, DARPA in the States, etc, etc. There's lots of these. These are programs where the um, national governments want to encourage the development of uh, technology, what they universally call pre-competitive technology. They want to encourage it to occur inside their uh, geographic area rather than somewhere else because they want to base their future economy on something and they see that it's a good investment. So they make money available, usually quite a lot of money available. And uh, the Horizon 2020 program uh, pays 100% of the cost of an engineer to work on a research project, which has got to be partnered, it's got to be in Europe. But as long as it's something that we want to do because it adds value to us, because it leads us to a capability, then it's something which is worth doing. The other thing that comes out of this is that these activities should be guided by a roadmap. What capabilities does it have to establish and where is it going to get them from? Acquisition, license, research independently or research in partnerships. And to complete the picture then you've got to talk about development engineers who are there primarily to deliver a technical product. Doesn't matter whether it's tangible or intangible, so hardware or software. Um, the thing is, it's something which fulfills a customer need and a business objective. The business objective is a, is a fairly significant point because if you've got a wonderful technical product, if it actually hasn't got a viable business model, then you might as well have a room full of feathers. It really doesn't, ca doesn't matter how good or how clever your solution is because you'll only ever make one of them or it may never even get off the drawing board. So it has to meet functional and non-functional criteria and increasingly this is a, uh, an important parameter which tends to, be, uh, tends to be overlooked. These are some examples of non-functional criteria. We know about power, we know about speed, um, but there is also things like re reproducibility, testability, uh, time to market, quality. These are abstract concepts and yet they are part of something that has to be designed into a product. Uh, maximizing product differentiation by using the tools in innov innovative ways and the technologies available in innovative ways and effectively using current capability, not doing it with what could arise. You know, I, we'd all like to include the effects of an anti-gravity machine or a time machine, but we can't and it would be a foolish of us. And just to make the point, engineers innovate by pushing the bounds of the capabilities. 
and that's that's a it doesn't say that this is a closed shop and all the exciting stuff is done by research not at all the opportunities here that occur presented by a particular product brief so the product actually gives you degrees of freedom that you can't possibly uh, visualize when you're purely looking at the, the the capability it gives you the ability to trade between capabilities which which i would call architecture if you wish which parts do you do in hardware which parts do you do in software which parts do you do in analog which parts do you do in mems or uh, surface acoustic waves um, <clears throat> and also using your wider sphere of knowledge. You know, as an engineer, you have connections with other engineers, both in the team and the world. And you base your, um, your innovation around collecting that. That can't be put into a machine. That is you, and it's what happens through your entire working life. <clears throat> but this is now much more directed. It is directed to specific business needs and product plans. So you don't have the luxury of thinking about arbitrary architectures at 48 and a half bit or, uh, or four level logic or anything else like that. You've got to make a product. It's an A53. It's, it's a specific thing and it has a specific budget, has a specific timeline. You can be innovative in it, but that's what you're making. To touch then on the product, a basis of a mutually beneficial business relationship and it's very interesting to think here that it's very different what we perceive a product to be from what a customer perceives a product to be. Now, we don't want this to happen because it doesn't really satisfy anybody. We all go away, we think we've got an agreement, but actually we're talking about totally different things. It's very important that we understand that customers don't use what we deliver. The exciting part of what we deliver is technology, right? Actually, the exciting part of what we deliver is the thing that satisfies the customer. And if he's not interested in the technology, he's purely interested in the functionality, we have to remember that. And without the business model, if I haven't already said it, uh, the relationship is unsustainable. So, conclusions then. Uh, capabilities limit a company's product possibilities. Um, innovative engineers produce differentiated products within this scope. And essentially, technology and, science and sciences are opportunities for tomorrow and the day after. It's not that they're not relevant, it just means that they have a role in the future of the company, not necessarily in the present. Um, businesses need to know that it can make products before they start to. Capabilities help them with this, of course. The development engineers use them to make mission-critical products. It's important that. That's what the development engineers are doing. Research engineers establishing the capability before they're needed to be used. Again, it's kind of obvious stuff, but if you don't... Uh, if you don't provide it before it's needed, then it's not there. It can't be used to make the mission critical product. Um, and the coordination of those should be through a roadmap. I've said that science, technology, capability and product, there is risk in between these stages, which I've emphasized in the words but not put into a diagram yet. Um, and businesses essentially want to minimize the risk. So they want to do things at this end of the chain, not at the other end of the chain. Uh, businesses can't afford risk. We're not in the businesses of making risk. We're in the businesses of making product. <clears throat> and end products, that is the cameras and the uh, smartphones and the tablets and the engine management systems and so on, they fund the whole life cycle. So they fund us developing the components and they also fund the research which goes on in the universities and the basic principles but only if the end customer buys them. Ultimately, it's the success of the end product which funds all of our activities, and including all of those activities which are in feeding science and technology into our products. They don't buy our technology, they buy solutions to their needs, and that's functionality. So, thank you very much. I'll take any questions.